you to look at this for these verses here. First Peter chapter 1, verse 18 and 19. For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Amen. Let me just say that that blood is absolutely pure blood. Amen. The Bible says here it's precious blood. But I'll say this, it's powerful blood. Amen. Uh, brother, there's no other blood like the blood of the Son of God. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Brother, that blood, uh, I, it doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter how far you've gone. It don't matter what your past is. That blood can wash you, amen. That blood can cleanse you. Uh, hey, let's take a minute. Can I show you the past of the blood? We got to go to the Old Testament for a minute. You go to thinking about what uh, the Lord has done for you. Leviticus 17 11. Here's what the Bible says. For the life of the flesh is in the blood. And I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that maketh atonement for the soul. The word atonement, that, that if you look it up in that 1828, amen, dictionary, <laughs> it says reparation paid when it says atonement. The equivalent, there has to be an equivalent suffering for, to match the offense that had taken place. But that's exactly what the Lord Jesus did when he shed his blood on Calvary. There was an equivalent suffering, amen, to the sin of all of mankind. You think about what your Savior did for you, oh, brother. I, let, me, let me give you another word. We know the word redeem, uh, and, and here's what it means. To buy back, to ransom, to liberate from captivity. You see, if I, when I read my Bible right, wasn't there a day when we was all captive? Wasn't there a day when every one of us, we were bound in our sin? Uh, brother, we were, we were sold under the slave market of sin. The Bible says over in Romans chapter 5 and verse 12, Wherefore is by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin. Now, you, may, you grew up going to church. I didn't grow up going to church all the time. Whenever the night I got saved and the preacher was preaching, uh, in fact, my preacher just, he deviated from the message. Uh, well, maybe I'll say this. He deviated from his outline and he preached the message. And he said, I don't know why I'm doing this tonight, but I just want to, I'm just going to, I'm just going to take my Bible and show you how to get saved. And that's the night I'm sitting there lost as a, as, as a ball in high grass. I didn't know, I, I had no idea how to get to heaven. I thought you lived. You see, when we got saved, I'm telling you, I thought Psalm was pasms. <laughs> yeah. I thought Job was Job, <laughs> and I thought Jeremiah was a bullfrog. I'll be honest with you. I, I did. That's all I knew. Amen. We didn't know anything about God. We didn't know anything about the Bible. I couldn't have quoted you one verse. And so here, I knew I had to die one day. I, I didn't doubt that. I thought, all right, I got to die. And if you'd asked me separately, I'd have said, uh, are you a sinner? Well, sure I am. I mean, anybody with a brain knows they sin, knows they do wrong. But I tell you what I didn't know. I didn't know that sin and death had anything to do with each other until that night. See, wherefore is by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin. Listen to this. And so death passed upon all men for that all have sinned. We often look and, and you know, we, we, try to, we try to look and say, well, I tell you what, oh, Hopkins there, he's a, he's a bad sinner. Oh, Rocky, he's a, he's a real bad sinner. And, and this one there, they, and we try to measure how, can I tell you something, we're all, hey, we were all a bunch of wicked lost sinners on our way to hell. Uh, we had no redeeming qualities about us. Our righteousness was as filthy rags, amen. I preach about growing up in a drunkard's home and all the mess that goes along with it. Had a, had a preacher one time, he borrowed that. He said, I grew up in a preacher's home and all the mess that goes along with it. I said, well, whatever, amen. I just know this, we all needed to be saved. Amen. See, the Lord knew that. The Lord knew that whenever man fell in the Garden of Eden, you see the fall of man, then you see the filthiness of man, but then you see what God had to do for the forgiveness of man. You see, we look back all the way back yonder uh, in the Garden of Eden, you know, when they sinned and, and God came walking in the, in the garden and he found them there. Everybody blamed it on somebody else, just like we do today. 
uh, I mean, I mean, uh, Adam's like, well, the woman you gave me, and the woman's like, well, the, the serpent beguiled me, and that's just, but here, don't throw off on them. We do the same thing. <laughs> Ain't nobody like just saying, hey, I'm wrong. We all want to say it's my wife's fault, husband's fault, kid's fault, preacher's fault, somebody else. The only person I've seen in the Bible that can't get help is somebody that won't repent. But you give me somebody that will just say, it's me, it's me, it's me, oh, Lord. <laughs> Standing in the need of prayer. Hey, it's me. Hey, hey, give me a lost man that won't argue with you about it, that will say, I'm lost, and I don't want to go to hell. That man's real close to getting saved right there. You want to get right tonight? Then give me somebody that will just say, I've been wrong. <laughs> man, I've gotten away from the Lord. I'm not where I ought to be, and I need to get right. Give me that man or woman. Hey, ten times out of ten. Then somebody that's trying to justify themselves about why, well, I, I'd do better if these other, no, it ain't anybody else's fault. See, this matter of sin, sin, the only difference between us and somebody out there on their way to hell is we're saved sinners. And they're lost sinners. You understand me? And so the Lord looked down and said, they all need my, they only have one payment that can be paid and I've got to pay it. Right there in the Garden of Eden, you know what happened. The Bible says over there, I believe it's in, uh, I believe it's chapter, uh, uh, chapter 3 verse 21 I jotted down he just said the Lord made coats of skins and clothed them see way back in, in, in the Old Testament the, the Lord said alright I'm going to start right here and I'm going to show you the way there's got to be bloodshed there's got to be bloodshed uh, how, where'd, they make, where'd they get the coats of skins God had to kill one of them animals he created God had to take one of those animals by the way before the curse he had to take one of those animals right there and he had to slay that animal. And he had to take, uh, when he slayed that animal, the blood was shed. And, and then the, the, the skins were severed off the muscles of that body of that animal. And then he made them coats of skins. And uh, brother, the, he was showing the way right there. Do you see that? I'm talking about the path of the blood. Amen. That path. Amen. Uh, by the way, if you read over there, I think it's over in uh, uh, Genesis chapter 22. Remember Abraham and Isaac? They're headed up uh, the mountain. The Lord said, take thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest. And he said, you take him up here and you offer him. And remember, they, they come to a place and just him and the lad go on. And, and the little boy says, Dad, I got the fire and, and, and here's the wood. He said, but where's the lamb for the burnt offering? Y'all remember what Abraham said? He said, my son, God will provide himself a lamb. Amen. And by the way, God did. Amen. Amen. Let me show you another. Hey, remember over there uh, in, at the, in, in, during the, the Passover lamb, uh, Egypt, uh, they're over there in Egypt. And boy, the Lord's come through and said, all right, I'm going to deliver you, but I'm sending my death angel through. I'm going to send this death angel through, and he's going, uh, every, every house that's got a, that eldest son, he's going to die. Uh, the death angel's going to pass by. And by the way, we all have that condemnation of sin over us, that of sin and death, amen. Uh, we deserve to die. There's nothing uh, uh, we've ever done that's worthy of going to heaven. Oh, no, you know you can't live good enough. You know you can't be good enough. You know you can't do good enough. It takes the blood. <laughs> So what I see with my Savior is this. I, I see that over there, uh, when, when it comes to the Passover, the Lord just said, take that blood. And he said, uh, you, you, you take this lamb without blemish and you, shall, you slay the lamb, take the blood, and put that over the doorpost. Put it on the side, put it on the top up there. And you know what happened? The death angel passed by. And here's with a statement. He said, when I see the blood, <laughs> I will pass over you. <laughs> oh, brother, aren't you glad that one of these days, uh, uh, brother, when the Lord looks at me and you, he don't see the old terror. He don't see the old life. All he sees is the blood. Amen. Hey, it's not about me. It's not about you. It's about the blood. Amen. Oh, hallelujah. Can I give you this? Hey, what about the tabernacle? <laughs> Man, that old tabernacle over there, and I, and I ain't got time to read Hebrews 9 and 10. You go home tonight and read all of it, amen. But it said that they would go in there, and it said they, were, it said they, they would kill the blood of bulls, shed the blood of bulls and goats, and they would go in and minister in that daily tabernacle, the outer court, the inner court, then the holy of holies. And once a year, the priests would go in, and they would take a basin, they would slay the... The, the, the animal and take the blood in they tie a little rope around him he had bells ringing on him if the, hey if the bell stopped ringing that meant he did something wrong and they jerked him out of there <laughs> they couldn't go in there that was the holy of holies but they had to do that every year 
Every year they take that blood in there and he'd do, he'd do it this year and if he did it just right, then you know what? One year, the sin was just covered. But there was always a remembrance of that old sin. Always a remembrance of that old wicked sin. Every, the next year he'd go do the same thing and there was, but they'd have to do it again the next and the next. You see, that was that earthly priest and that was that earthly pattern but one day there came a man named Jesus. Amen. And can I tell you what he did? He died on Calvary. And by the way, his blood wasn't like anybody else's blood. Amen. This wasn't the blood of a bull. This wasn't the blood of a goat. Amen. And this was no ordinary priest. It was the son of God. Amen. And when he died and shed his blood, I believe he took it into heaven itself, into the holy of holies, and applied the blood on the mercy seat. Amen. For me and you. <laughs> oh, preacher. All right, so 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 what's the big deal, preacher? Can I just tell you what? There's only one way to heaven, and that's through the blood. There's only one way in, and that's through the blood. You don't get there another way. You said, what's that old song? It's still the blood that saves from sin. It's still the blood that cleanses within, amen. Uh, I, the, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanseth us from all sin. You say, preacher, why? Uh, how do you know? What, what does that blood do? You see, I, again, my family, we were, if you came down to our house and there was a full stock bar downstairs, and I mean, people came in and out of our house, all kind of wickedness. There's things that I, I, all these years, and I still don't preach on some of the things that I saw that went on down there just out of respect for the family. I'm just saying, I, why, I don't want to magnify that wickedness is what I'm saying. I've gone down, we've come downstairs after a night of their drinking. I remember a, a man named old uh, Owsley, they called him, and he, and he was laid out down there in the floor, and here's what they, they drank himself, he drank himself into a stupor. He had thrown up down there uh, all over the floor and laid down and wallowed in all of that mess. And I, I, I come downstairs as a kid, and I, I'm just telling you, I, I looked at all that, and I said, you know what, that's what they ought to put on that commercial, this bud's for you. Hey, you think I can handle that drink? That drink will handle you. You think, well, I can handle that sin? That sin will handle you, amen. Well, well I can break free any time I want. Then why ain't you broke free yet? There's only one thing that can free you. <laughs> That's the blood of Jesus, amen. <laughs> hey, let me give you something simple here. The path of the blood. How about the power of the blood? The power of the blood, amen. Now, John the Baptist, let me tell you what kind of power it had. Jesus I came. Remember when Jesus, uh, I'd have hated to have been the man that John the Baptist was baptizing when Jesus came walking. <laughs> Jesus is walking. He had glub, glub, glub. That fellow floated down the river. Amen. <laughs> but I tell you what I see. I, it got John's attention, and John looked, and John identified him immediately. Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Brother, he, say, he was making a statement right there. Uh, brother, I mean, the, well, a prophetic statement that would come to pass. Hey, nobody could take away our sin but Jesus, amen. Hey, I, I, again, our family, I'm just looking at ours, bound in all of that mess. But broken already, broken before we ever, I ever even moved up, lived with uh, mama and them, they divorced. I then lived with daddy, all of that stuff. I was every, I'm one of them every other weekend kids. And, uh, and, and by the way, my parents weren't these kind that like get along. I'm sorry, but look, if you divorce, don't be like my don't be like my lost parents at the time where they hated each other. They don't look up here and feel sorry. You know, it didn't affect me at all. <laughs> I'm good. <laughs> I can tell you this: our family was bound hand and foot with that sin. But when I go to thinking about the power that's in the blood, can I give you something? It's eternal blood. When I say eternal, hey, you know, when the lady has a baby, the, that blood is determined by the Father. Is that right? Well, can I tell you, the, uh, Mary was overshadowed by the Holy Ghost. Amen. And that holy thing that was born of her was the Son of God. Amen. You know whose blood was flowing through Jesus? God Almighty. <laughs> Oh, eternal blood, amen. Hey, not like any other blood that had ever been shed. They shed a lot of blood for to cover that sin for years and years. But it was eternal blood. It was the blood of God. And then I give you this: it was immaculate blood. There's uh, that, that that word immaculate talks that has the connotation of of cleansing a stain. Can I tell you, sin stains everybody it ever touches. 
Sin, hey, sin darkens your life. Uh, sin messes up. By the way, when you say the lost man, hey, it darkens the saved man's life. It darkens the saved lady's life. What in the world has saved people got doing work? Hey, running around and staining their life with a bunch of sin after the Lord Jesus shed his precious blood for the likes of me and you, amen. But I want to tell you what, I think about over there in, the, in the Isaiah, Isaiah just said, come, he said, come now. <laughs> Let us reason together, saith the Lord. He said, though your sins be like scarlet, they shall be white as snow, though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. And the Lord's saying, I've got immaculate blood. I, there's nothing, but preacher, mine's too dirty. My sin's too dirty. I, I'm not worthy. Who is worthy to get saved? Every once in a while we get into that. Well, I, I tell you, I'm, I'm not worthy. And, I, and I, hey, just agree with the devil. I'm not worthy either. I ain't worthy to get saved. I ain't worthy to preach. I ain't worthy to be a, a husband. I ain't worthy to be a daddy. But God had mercy. You know why you're sitting here tonight? Because God looked down and had mercy on you too. Oh, hey, hey, I'm telling you, that same blood, amen. It's immaculate blood. Here, let me give you something. How about emancipating blood? I had to look that one up in the dictionary. <laughs> you know what that just means? Hey, it frees you. It frees you. Can I tell you, after Jesus passed by our way, he came down by our house, and daddy got saved, and stepmama got saved, and and, and then my brother and then I got saved and all of that. You should have been there that afternoon when we took every, hey, hey everything in that bar, every box of long neck Budweiser stacked up against the wall and we opened every one of them and poured every one of them out out there in the backyard, amen. Well, well, wait a minute now, that stuff costs money. Hey, that's the stuff that had bound our family. But now Jesus has passed by. Now the blood's been applied, amen. And I tell you what God does, he changes people, amen. We didn't need that anymore. We had Jesus, praise God. It's emancipating blood, amen. Hey, let me give you another. <laughs> How about erasing blood? Old devil comes and says, hey, devil's blood. He, he has got it out for every one of us. He's the accuser of the brethren. Oh, and by the way, he's got plenty to say. Now say amen. Brother Bobby, I don't, I don't know you. He's got plenty to say about you. <laughs> but not, hey, not any more than he's got to say about me. Amen. Sister, not any more he's got to say about you. Hey, boys, not any more he's got to say about you. I can go to the youngest and we can go to the oldest and I can say, he can point his accusing finger at me and you and he can say, but oh, let me tell you, I, I tell you, I watched them today and I've seen this and the Lord though, but the Lord comes down, remember, it's erasing blood. The Bible says over in Psalm 1 3 that our seas, or our sins have been, uh, it says have been cast as far as the east is from the west and that there's no remembrance of them, you understand? Remember that old song, Tell Me What Sins Are oh, You Talking About? <laughs> the devil comes and starts throwing all that stuff up, and you know what the Lord says? Tell me what sins are you talking about? I got a record book right here. I got a Lamb's Book of Life, and I see nothing right here. All I see is my son Jesus. All I see is the blood, amen. He erased our sins. There's no record of them anymore. Man alive, are you kidding? Hey, now there's some counties you can go in. And we might find some of our names. <laughs> I didn't say your name. I said our. <laughs> but there ain't no record up in heaven. It's the Lord's unwiped away, and then it's just exceptional blood. I'm just saying, it's one of a kind. It's one of a kind. It's so precious. When I hey, when you get weary as a pastor, when you when you're like, Lord, is it worth? Man alive, you're beating your head against the, the wall. And Lord, you're trying to love them and you're trying to preach. And, and Lord, they come and they go and all of these things go on. Brother, all I can tell you is, is I can sit down and I just take a minute and I don't get my eyes on this. My problem is, is I got it on them people. Now, don't look up here like that. You do the same thing. We get our eyes on people. That right, preacher boy, he left the old time way. We get our eyes on preachers. Well, he, he ain't what he ought to be. He shouldn't have done that. He, you're right. But we got our eyes on the preacher. We got our eyes on people. And we got our eyes on the problems. And I'll tell you what takes my eyes off all of that. If I can get someplace and get on my knees 
And hey, Brother Daniel, if I can get in that Bible, and then in a little while I can get to go to talking to the Lord, and I tell you what I talk to him about. I get my eyes off of the people and off the preacher and off the problems, and I put it on that precious blood. Now I start thinking about what my Savior did for the likes of me. Oh, brother, how unworthy I am uh, even to be saved or even to do anything. And, uh, and uh, by the way, isn't it amazing uh, all those things that I was telling God, well, this sure is hard, God, and, I, and this sure was difficult, God. And he says, how hard was it when my son trudged up Calvary's cross? How hard was it when they laid the cat of nine tails on his back? How hard was it when they drove the nails in his darling hands, amen, when he shed his blood for the likes of me and you? And when I put my eyes on the blood, I'm going to tell you something. I go on another mile. <laughs> hey, I read up. Hey, man. Oh, Lord, it's not as hard. I, God, forgive me for complaining. I, I, God, I'm sorry. I, hey, I'm just telling you, you get your eyes on the blood and get it off all that other, you keep going too. I give you the last thing. I, just the proof of the blood. What do you mean the proof, preacher? Is that all I can tell you when I, how do you know the blood's really that powerful? How do you know it's that potent? How do you, how do you know? Because just number one, it's real simple. Our sins are gone. <laughs> I said our sins are gone. I said our sins are gone. Hey, man. They're not, hey, there's no remembrance of them in the eyes of God. The only person going to bring up your sin is you, your enemies, and the devil. <laughs> but God, has God ever one time thrown your past in your face? Has God ever one time said, hey, 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 he just brought anything up that's under his blood? He ain't never done it, has he? See, I tell you, boy, he's an excellent preacher. You're, you're right. No wonder we get so defeated. We, hey, we actually think it's us. Well, I tell you what, if I, we're not that crowd that thinks we have to keep ourselves saved, are we? Now, come on now. Hey, we're not that crowd that thinks you lose your salvation, are you? No. We know the word of God. We know it's eternal life, amen. I said we know it's eternal life, amen. And by the way, it never has been about us. It's about the blood, amen. It's about the Son of God. It's about what he did for me and you, and our sins are gone, amen. i tell you what else. The, the, uh, us, uh, us saints, we get real glad now. I get happy. The Hensons go to singing and my, my eyes roll back in my head. I'm like, oh. the preachers go to preaching and I'm like, I don't think I've ever heard it that good. Hey, man, I mean, it gets a hold of me now. It never was like that before. What happened to you? The blood. <laughs> All of a sudden now, that blood say, my sins are gone and I'm a saint that's glad, amen. I'm just brother glad to be saved. I'm glad to get to preach. I'm glad to know y'all. I ain't worthy of none of it. You ain't either, but God's good. Yeah. Woo! And I say this, our Savior is glorified. Man, you mean God gets the glory out of me and you being washed? Absolutely. Read over there in Revelation when you got time. Turn over there to chapter 5. Look over in chapter 19. And everything is about him. And it's about how he's worthy of glory and power and honor. I mean, and riches. I mean, you name it, he deserves it. Can I just tell you what? My Savior gets the glory. We got a, I don't know what all God's going to do right here at Emmanuel. I don't know what all God's going to do down at Heritage. I'll be honest with you, preacher. I want God, I want the Son of God to get the glory. Yes. Only one life to a soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. And we're going to live our lives one of two ways, church. We live our lives where there's aspects of it where it points to us. And we get the glory. Not much benefit to it. Not, not real good pay. Say amen. Or tonight you could say, Lord, I'm going to put my eyes back on that precious blood. And I want to live my life in a way where you get the glory. God, where everything I do, it's about you. It's for you. And if it gets done, it's through 
you. I was cutting up about that dropping the ball, but ain't it the truth? I don't have the ball. See, tonight, I got up. Jesus, you ever had that, run, that running back or that quarterback when you play ball? They're like, give me the ball. You're like, here. <laughs> the Lord just says, you give me that ball. You just give me the ball, I'll do the preaching. You're going soul winning, give me the ball. Amen. I, I'll, do the, hey, I'll do the soul winning. It don't matter what you're doing, do you see? Hey, you, I hope you can understand this. I just say this, thank God for the blood. Put your eyes on your darling Savior and on what the Lord called his precious blood that he shed for me. And you bow your heads, preacher. Matthew chapter 13. When you read chapter 13 in its entirety, you'll find there's a, there's a great multitude of people that's gathered along the seashore. And they're listening to Jesus. According to verse 2, he then, seeing the multitude, he enters into a ship. He sits down and he begins to teach them. And then in verse number 3, the Bible tells us that he spake many things unto them in parables. Now, we know tonight that a parable, by definition, is simply an earthly illustration that reveals a heavenly truth. There's one thing about the Lord Jesus that's always amazed me. And it's the fact that he never preached nor taught over people's heads. I mean, you always, when you hear him preaching and teaching to those around him, for example, when he talked to about the farmer going out uh, sowing the seed, they certainly understood what he was talking about. Whenever he spoke of the shepherd seeking the sheep and tending the flock, they also knew what he was talking about. I got to say beyond any doubt, Jesus was a master at using the simplicity of a parable to teach a profound truth to those that were around him. If you'll look with me tonight in verse number 45, the Bible says, again, the kingdom of heaven is likened to a merchant man seeking goodly pearls, who, when he hath found one, uh, one pearl of great price, went, and sold all that he had and bought it. I want to use these two verses tonight and preach for just a few minutes on this thought. Goodly pearls at a great price. Goodly pearls at a great price. Now, by way of introduction, I discovered that some writers believe different things about what this pearl represents in this parable. Some believe that it, it represents the Lord Jesus, which i got to confess, I do realize how precious he certainly is. But I like what one writer did say describing how precious the Lord is. He said that he is, his comeliness never ceases. His delightfulness never dwindles. His faithfulness never fails. His forgiveness will never falter. And his love never lessens. And his righteousness never recedes. Yet in all of that, and I believe, you know, we consider the, these verses tonight in their context, we'd have to conclude that Jesus is not that pearl that he's speaking of here in the parable. Other writers believe that this pearl of great price is the nation of Israel. Once again, when you look at this in the context of the passage, even though they are God's chosen people, they are the apple of his eye. You and, I, you and I would have to conclude that he's not talking about the nation of Israel. You say, well, preacher, if it's not the Lord Jesus, if it's not the nation of Israel, then what is this pearl of great price that he's talking about? Well, I'm glad you asked. I believe in the context of the Scripture tonight, if you'll look, you'll find the pearl is a picture of the church collectively and you and I as born again believers individually. You see the merchant man in verse 45 I believe is a picture of the Lord Jesus. I base that on three things tonight. Number one we find the merchant man is seeking that pearl. Just like God saw Adam and Eve in the garden. And just like the shepherd in Luke chapter 15 uh, went out and sought after that, that one lost sheep. And once he had found it, he picked it up and put it on his shoulder and placed it into the fold. Yeah. 
I thought about that Wednesday night back in 1980, 41 years ago. Now I'll be honest with you, some of you have heard me tell it, but I just never get tired of telling it. 41 years ago on a Wednesday night, Brother Doug, the, the great high priest, the Lord of glory, that came to where I was in the person of the Holy Ghost. He convicted me of my sin, showed me I was on my way to hell. And on that Wednesday night, I went down at the altar. Nothing but an old long-haired, pot-smoking, pill-popping, powder-snorting, hippie drunk. And he reached further down than I ever could have reached up. And he saved my never dying soul. I'll go ahead and tell you, oh, what a Savior. Oh, what a friend he's been to me. I thought about this. There was times when I didn't love him, Brother Sidney, but he still loved me. Hey, there was time when he wasn't in my heart. But I'll go ahead and tell you, I love that song when he was on the cross, I was on his mind. But I'll be honest with you, before the foundation of the world, I was already on his mind. We see number two, not only we see him seeking after the pearl, but we also find the merchant man sacrificing for that pearl. Look with me again there in verse 46. The Bible says, Who when he found one pearl of great price, said he went and sold all that he had. Yeah. Yeah. You say, well, preacher, exactly how much did it cost the Lord Jesus yeah. for mine and your redemption? Yeah. I'll tell you how much it cost him. It cost him everything. Yeah. Oh, me and Brother Daniel was sitting there talking and he leaned over. He had no idea what I was preaching. And he said, the Lord emptied out heaven for you and me. Yes. Boy, I thought about that. John 3, 16 is a realization of that sacrifice. Yes. That God so loved the world and that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him yes. should not perish but have everlasting life. Yes. For God sent not his son into this world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Yes. Salvation's free, but you mark it down, it's not cheap by any means. Bible says that we were by nature the children of wrath, and we were vile and wicked, that we were depraved and corrupt. Yet the Bible goes on and tells us, for his great love wherewith he loved us, that even when we were dead in our trespasses and in our sin, he died on the cross for you and me, and rose again the third day. We see the merchant man seeking after the pearl. We see him sacrificing all that he has for the pearl. But then thirdly, notice with me, we find the merchant man securing the pearl in verse 46. The Bible says that he bought it. He just didn't go seeking after it. He just didn't go looking for it. But when he found it, he bought it. I thought about this. <laughs> In other words, this verse is telling you and I tonight the labor was finished. He's telling you and I the work was done and the transaction was complete. Over in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18, Jesus didn't say, upon this rock I may build my church. He didn't say, upon this rock I might build my church. He didn't say, upon this rock I hope to build my church. But he looked at Simon Peter and he said, Peter, upon this rock I'll build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I want to ask you a question. I wonder why the Lord likened his people, the church, to a pearl. wonder why he didn't liken it to a diamond or a ruby or an emerald or a sapphire. Let me give you three truths real quick about a pearl that I hope will answer that question for us. Notice with me, first of all, I want you to notice the conception of the pearl. Scientists tell us that the pearl is the only gem that is formed in an animal. And that animal being, of course, an oyster. Three things have got to happen in order to produce a pearl. Number one, they tell us that a particle is involved in its conception. Of course, that particle being nothing more than a grain of sand. 
Doesn't matter how big it becomes, doesn't matter how beautiful that it ever gets, doesn't matter how expensive that purse, that pearl may become, it started out as nothing more than a worthless piece of dirt. Not only do we see the particle involved, but then there's the place involved in its conception. See, they'll tell you that every natural pearl, not man-made now, but natural pearl, is conceived at the bottom of an ocean floor. Again, doesn't matter how big it gets, doesn't matter how beautiful it gets, or how, how expensive that it may become, it started out as nothing more than a worthless piece of dirt at the bottom of the ocean floor. There's the particle, and then, of course, there's the place, and then there's the pain involved in its conception. Right. Yeah. I tell you, I thought about this tonight. Oysters belong to a group of animals that don't have any bones. Another characteristic of the oyster is that the shell around it is actually its home. And in order to produce a pearl, they tell us that a grain of sand somehow makes its way, its entrance through that shell of that, uh, of that oyster. <laughs> I tell you, I don't know about you, but that grain of sand actually pierces, the, pierces and wounds the side of the oyster. And again, it doesn't matter how big it gets. Oh, by the way, did I tell you, it doesn't matter how beautiful it becomes. It doesn't matter how expensive it may be. That it, was, it took pain and suffering. That's what was involved in its conception. May I say everybody here tonight, saved by the good grace of God, we were without Christ. Hey, there was a time we were out hope. Well, we were without any kind of, of hope whatsoever. We were nothing more than a worthless piece of dirt. Can I go ahead and get real honest with you? We were worse than dirt. Bible says that we were nothing but, but dust. You know what dust is, don't you? It's a byproduct of dirt. Hey, I'm not the sharpest knife in the drawer, but I'm in the drawer. <laughs> Glory to God. We see here tonight, not only do we find the conception of the pearl, but then there's the covering of the pearl. Now I'll go ahead and tell you this if Christ hadn't died some 2,000 years on an old rugged tree there'd be no reason for you and I gathered here tonight there's the conception but then there's also the covering now the oyster produces they tell us a substance it's kind of like saliva now whether y'all caught on yet or not I am from the deep south down there we call it spit <laughs> Miss Annette, you didn't hear me say that. <laughs> but that saliva, it, it secretes in. And when a grain of sand pierces the side of that oyster, a covering process takes place. Now watch this. Three things happen. They tell us the oyster actually accepts that grain of sand. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 12 says that we were without Christ being aliens. Verse number 19 says that you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. And over in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 6, the Bible says to the praise of His glory and grace, wherein He hath made us accepted. Accepted in the beloved. You know what got us accepted in the beloved? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Hey, what can make us whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Now watch this. Not only do we see as that grain of sand accepted, and what, but once it's covered, but that oyster goes a step further, and that, that it literally gets to the point that it's like, saying, grain of sand, I don't mind having you around. You're not bothering me. I think, matter of fact, I'm going to claim you. I think I'm literally going to, you belong to me now, so you're mine. So Brother Sidney, we go from being accepted in the blood to being adopted. 
Oh, Lord. Songwriter said, y'all catch on real quick. I sing worse than I preach, so stay with me. Songwriter said, I once was an outcast, stranger on earth, a sinner by choice and an alien by birth. Oh, but I've been adopted. Yeah. My name written down. Yeah. I'm an heir to a mansion. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Got a robe and a crown. Yeah. I'm a child of the king. Yeah. Yes, a child of the king. Yeah. With Jesus my Savior. Yeah. I'm a child of the king. Yeah. You know what's good about being adopted? Praise God, you can never get unadopted. Hey, my youngest girl, she'll be 16. Well, good Lord willing, if we live to see September the 3rd and, uh, of this year, we adopted Allie uh, back up going on 16 years ago now. And you know the one thing that can never happen to Allie? I can never unadopt her. I can never disown her. I can never turn her away and say she's not mine. Hey, I want to tell you, praise God, Allie was picked. She was chosen. Don't let that word fool you, uh, scare you now. Uh, she was chosen. She was picked. We picked her to be a part of the Cato family. Hey, I'm glad, praise God, the Holy Ghost was dispatched to where you were and to where I were. And listen, he broke our heart over our sin. And I'm glad on that Wednesday night, Brother Doug, I got in the Whosoever Will Club. That whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And hey, you can get adopted in the family of God. Lord of God. There was a time literally when we were alienated. But now we're ambassadors. There was a time when we were in bonds of iniquity. But now we're blessed. There was a time when we were corrupt. But now we've been made clean. There was a time when you and I were guilty. But glory to God. We found grace in the eyes of God. Hey, I'm glad for that day I found grace. Hey, you know what that tells me? Hey, long before I found grace, grace came looking for me. Not only is that grain of sand accepted and adopted, but they also tell us that once it's covered, it's adorned. In other words, Brother Barry, it don't look like it used to. It don't... It, it don't, it don't even feel the same, be honest with you. What do you mean, preacher? Well, stay with me a minute. Over there in the Bible, in the book of 1st, 2nd Corinthians, brother, chapter 5, and verse 17 says what? If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Behold all... Listen, all things are made new in our life. The old things pass away, and behold, all things are made new. I'm glad 41 years ago I came to Jesus. Nothing more than just an old worthless piece of dirt. But a covering process took place. You say, well, preacher, you don't look like much. Well, hang on. You don't either. But God's not finished working on us. Hey, God's still work. Hey, I'm a work in progress. Hey, one day, praise God, I'm going to step out on the street of gold. I'm going to see gates of pearl and walls of jasper. Hey, one day, praise God, I'm going to see Him who is all together lovely. And then and only then will you and I be complete. We see here the conception of the pearl. We see the covering of the pearl. This is, real, this is really where I want to get to. Last of all, I want to call your attention to the consummation of the pearl. Now they tell me that divers will go down and they'll remove that pearl from the bottom of the ocean floor. Now I've been told that some of the most beautiful pearls, Brother Rock, are dug up and are found in some of the lowest places. Wow. Hallelujah. Woo! Yeah. Yeah. Brother Rock, let me ask you. Do you think you was in a low place? 
when the Holy Ghost came to where you were. Yeah. Brother Jerry, were you pretty low? Oh, yeah. You was one of them river rats. Yeah. Chiggers all over him. <laughs> Unto God. I don't think I'll ever forget that message. I'm getting away from it. I mean, was you in a low place, Brother Denny, when the Holy Ghost came to you? Brother Mike, were you pretty down? I mean, were you pretty far at the bottom, Brother Doug? I mean, how low were you when, Brother Daniel, when the Holy Ghost came to where you were? Brother Johnny, I'd have to say, was pretty down and now. Some of the most beautiful pearls are dug up from some of the lowest places. I mean, who would ever thunk it that an old transplant from South Carolina would be up here, praise God, on a Friday night, Friday night live, the Friday night Super Bowl. I mean, a spiritual believers, amen. Hey, had it not been for the grace of God of coming to where I was, I'll go ahead and tell you, praise God, the Lord could have dropped me off in hell on that Tuesday before I got saved on Wednesday. And he still would have been God. He still would have been holy. He still would have been righteous. He still would have been the King of kings and the Lord of lords. I'll go ahead and say something. Some sitting here tonight, same way I was. I mean, go ahead and take your halo off and just put it under your pew. But Doug said a moment ago, some just been looking. You just might go ahead and, and get on in. The water's fine. I mean, some was just like myself, just low as low down and out. I mean, on my way to hell. But now look at you. Everything that you are tonight is because of Christ Jesus. I mean. Can I preach a minute? I mean, Brother Jordan, you wasn't always sitting on the pew with a King James Bible. Now, I don't know, there might not have been many days you was raised in church. But I'm talking about spiritually speaking, the God of that Bible hadn't always been in your heart. Right. Hey, that listen, many sitting here tonight, you hadn't always been here with a nice suit on. Right. Right. Tie. I hate these things, don't y'all? I know we ain't, excuse me, I know we ain't supposed to hate nothing. But I dislike them. Matter of fact, that you can trace them back to Alexandria, Egypt. Ain't nothing good come out of Egypt, but <laughs> but I mean, what I'm getting at is this: you hadn't always been here with a smile on your face. You ladies hadn't always been here uh, dressed nice. I mean, you young as you had, you hadn't always. Some of you hadn't always had parents that brought you to church. But now look what happened. Yeah. <laughs> Brother Hopkins, let me ask you something. Did you ever dream you'd be on church on a Friday night with your in-laws? <laughs> I mean, what a blessing. You know that's God gets you to fellowship with your in-laws. Say amen right there. <laughs> Stay with me now. I'm, a, I'm about done. Stay with me. I hope not said that. <laughs> Once that pearl is removed from that oyster shell, let me say this, by, it is by no means perfect. Now, I know you'd be hard convincing some folks this, but we still fall short of the glory of God many days of our life. But you know what? Now listen. They tell me that they got what they call peelers that a peel away on that oyster, getting all the getting all those infirmities out of them, yeah. right. cleaning them up, polishing them up. Thank you, preacher. Polishing them up. And listen, I thought about what the Bible says in Ephesians chapter two and verse seven, because the reason those peelers are are cleaning that pearl up is because it's going to be displayed. Amen. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 7 the Bible says that in the ages to come yes. that he might show the exceeding, exceeding riches of his grace yes. and his kindness toward us yes. in Christ Jesus. Yes. Now I'm going to go ahead and tell you one day when we step out on the street of gold and we get to heaven I don't believe the Lord is going to say by any means I want you to see my greatest possession, my greatest treasure, my greatest 
accomplishment and tell everybody to look at these, this, this street of gold and these walls of jasper and, and these gates of pearl. Oh no, it's not in that a lot by any man. But here yeah. is my greatest yeah. treasure. Yeah. A number that no man can number. Uh -huh. I'm going to go ahead and tell you, don't let it shock you. Did you know they're going to be more than Baptist in heaven? Matter of fact, I'm really going to shock you. Did you know Baptists ain't just, it ain't Baptists going to heaven. I mean, all born again believers by the grace of God's going to heaven, am I right? But I do believe in going first class, don't misunderstand me. That's why I am a Baptist. A Bible believing Baptist. Blood washed, born again. Name written down in the Lamb's Book of Life. I mean, beloved, hey, I tell you right now, thank God for the ages to come that I'll be numbered, you'll be numbered among the living in the, in the presence of God. Amen. That is the great pearl that God bought. Hey, I'll be honest with you, Brother Dean, I didn't deserve it. I know I'm looking at some tonight, probably you, you, may, you may have deserved it, but I didn't. I mean, I knew, I know who I was. I know where I was, Brother Barry. I know what kind of shape I was in. But I'm so grateful, praise God, that when Jesus said, Upon this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail it, He is talking about me. He's talking about you. Brother Doug, if you'll come, I'm done. Thanks to listeners like you, IBC has had over 100,000 views on our YouTube channel. If you haven't already, subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.